Well, good morning to all of you who are here. Good morning if you are worshiping online. My name is Annie Duncan. I'm the executive pastor here, and it is so good to be with you in worship. Uh, this morning, uh, scripture comes from two different places, the book of Romans and the gospel of Matthew. First from Romans. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have all together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And from the Gospel of Matthew, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So when I was a kid, maybe about five years old, uh, I remember one night I couldn't sleep. And so I snuck out of bed and I found my mom and I crawled onto her lap. And I just proceeded to confess all the things that I, as a five-year-old, thought that I had done wrong. Weird, no wonder I couldn't sleep, right? Uh, and I confessed to her things like, oh, you know, it was actually me that locked my brother in the bathroom. Uh, he didn't get stuck in there himself, sorry. I lied to you about that. And that cookie that you thought magically disappeared, it was me that ate it, sorry about that. And I kicked the dog and I mean, on and on, like the just the list kept on going. And my sweet mom had to like bite her tongue to keep from laughing because I was so serious about needing to confess my sins and for some reason needing to confess them to her. Um, what, what is your understanding of sin? Like, can you remember the first time that maybe you realized, hey, us humans, we don't really have it all together. Uh, maybe you have a hard time recognizing sin and, what it is, and understanding what it is. Or maybe you can easily spot sin in those around you, but have a harder time seeing it in your own life. I know that's sometimes me. Um, we're in a sermon series called, Is It Good or Is It God? And we're taking a, a look at the basic things that we believe as Christians. And we're gaining some clarity because there's a lot of stuff that gets said out there in culture, but we are trying to align with scripture and look at the Bible and ask God, God, what do you say about this? And today, you might have guessed it already, we're talking about sin. Sin, what is it? Why does it matter? So first, what is it? Sin is a condition that affects everything. Everything. I mean, everything around us. It affects how we treat ourselves. It affects how we treat others, how we handle money, our views on power, our views on sex, how we spend our time, how we treat others that think differently than us. I mean, it affects everything. It's everywhere. And because sin affects everything, here's what it does. Sin separates us from God. Last week, Scott talked about the Trinity and how God is a God of relationship. We're made to be in relationship. And sin, sin separates us from God and because it breaks down that relationship and it breaks down our relationship with others. And we see this throughout the entire narrative in the Bible. In Genesis 1, God created everything and it was good. In Genesis 1 and 2, he creates human beings and we're supposed to care and watch over all of creation. And then in Genesis 3, sin enters the world because Adam and Eve, they question and they disobey God. And then the rest of the Bible and up until today, God is on this rescue mission to save us from this condition of sin. And because of this condition of sin, we commit individual sins every single day, every day. Some of them are obvious and out in the open, like murder, adultery, or yelling at somebody when they cut you off on 405. Am I alone in that? Does, okay, maybe just, just, just yelling when Annie is cut off at 405. Okay, I'm just making sure you're there. Uh, and then others are more devious, and they're like, under the radar, you know, things like gossip or jealousy or those passive aggressive eye rolls that you give to your husband when he tells you that you're talking too much. Like those are, those are sinful, but they're a little bit under the radar. And then there's this whole gray area of sin, like 
things that we don't think are sin, but maybe they impact others around us negatively. Like me being super excited that Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady aren't in the playoffs. Like, I'm super excited about that, but I know that there's a couple here that are huge Packer, Packer fans, go Pack go, and they might be negatively impacted by my excitement, right? So is that, what is that? Is that sin? What is it? And then sins, they can be in two different categories, right? Sins of commission and sins of omission. A sin of commission, while it might sound like a good thing, like something you might get a 10% payout on, it's actually something that you do that you're not supposed to do. I mean, just think about the Ten Commandments and the long list of you shall not do this, you shall not do that, right? And then sins of omission are things that you don't do that you're supposed to do. Like love God, love those around you. Sins of omission are those missed opportunities of how we can live the way that God intends us to live. So that is a ton of information about sin. Sin, and on its own, it can sound a little bit depressing, but hang on, don't worry, there is hope, there is a remedy, there is a cure. It's coming at the end, and even more so, it's coming next week when Scott Dudley preaches on the next topic in this series. So make sure to come back next week. So if the what of sin is that it separates of separates us from God, then why, why does sin matter? The exact same reason, because it separates us from God. And if sin separates us from God and we are made to be in relationship with God, then Bell Press, we've got to face our sin. And there's a number of reasons why we have to face our sin, but I'm just gonna give you three today. We need to face our sin because one, we can't fix a problem we won't admit we have. Last March, on the morning of my 40th birthday, my husband was going to take me to Leavenworth, one of my favorite places. But on the morning of my birthday, I woke up with a little bit of a headache. And I was like, oh no. And I thought to myself, I'm fine, I'm fine, everything's fine. Popped an Advil, started to pack. And then my husband woke up a few hours later and he goes, happy birthday. And he took one look at me and he's like, whoa, what's wrong with you? And I was like, oh no, nothing. Everything's fine, everything's fine which was a lie. And guess what a lie is? A lie is a sin. So let's see where this lie takes us, right? So we pack the car and we leave our home in Sammamish and make our way to the I-90 on-ramp where we're going to head east for Leavenworth. But in the 15 minutes that it took to get from our home to the I-90 on-ramp, I started to really, really not feel well. But again, I lied, and this time, not only to my husband, but also to myself. I said things to myself like, oh, Annie, you're fine. You just need to drink some more water. You're dehydrated. Or, oh, Annie, you're fine. You're just really excited. It's your birthday. Or, oh, Annie, you're fine. This is just what it feels like to be 40. So, <laughs> but as we approached I-90, I knew I really needed some clarity on what was going inside going on inside my body. So I prayed, God, if I'm really sick and we need to turn this car around, show me and show me now. And instantly I got the cold sweats and thought I was gonna puke. So I said to my husband, turn the car around. I'm sick, I've been lying to you. Sorry, we're not going to Leavenworth. Happy birthday to me. <laughs> so where did that little lie take us that morning? Well, it almost took us to Leavenworth. Uh, which would have been miserable because I did end up being quite sick for the next four days. But let's play out that lie a little bit more. What if I'd continued to lie to my husband? What if we'd gotten on I-90 and started making our way to Leavenworth? Well, by that time, I would have thrown up in his car. He would have been pissed, right? And my fever would have spiked and given me the chills, and I would have been miserable, and we would have been trying to have fun in Leavenworth, but the whole time, my husband would have been saying to me, why are you lying to me? You are sick. We need to go home, right? This is a story, really happened, but it is also a metaphor of how sin can deceive us, right? And wreak havoc in our lives and those around us. Bell Press, we can't fix a problem we won't admit we have. And often, like in the case of this story, I needed to stop lying and admit that I was sick. We need to stop sinning and admit that we sin. And more often than not, those around us can see the sin in our lives easier than we can see it. And always, 
every single time. Jesus can see it before we see it. In Romans 3, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's all of us. No one's excluded from this. It's a level playing field here. The downside of sin is that it separates us from God and breaks down our relationship with others. And we can't fix a problem that we won't admit we have. And a lot of times with sin, we don't see sin as a problem. We just don't see it as a problem because we are so accommodating of it. We get so comfortable with it. Like greed, take greed for example. Greed works well for us because it means we get to live comfortably as we hoard all of these resources and go on bougie vacations. Lust, lust works really well for us because it gives us the dopamine hit that our brains are craving in that moment, works well. We're really accommodating with maybe various kinds of addiction, right? Because sometimes life is really hard and we just need to numb out for a little while. But what to greed? lust, and all kinds of addiction, and all sin, what do they all have in common? They separate us from God. They separate us from relationship with others. So they end up being a pretty big problem, and sometimes we can't see those problems, but they're problems that we need to admit to having, which is why we need to pray. Show me. God, show me. Show me my sin. In the story I just told about not going to Leavenworth, when I prayed, God, if I'm really sick, show me, God showed me, and he not, not only showed me that I was sick, but he also showed me that I had been lying, lying to myself and lying to my husband. And that is the same prayer that we get to pray about our sin. We get to go to God and we get to God, say, okay, God, I, I read in the Bible that I've got this condition of sin, but God, I can't see it right now, so show me. Show me where I'm messing up. Show me, show me my sin. Help me see it. And as we grow deeper in our relationship with Jesus, uh, get, getting closer and closer to him, we're going to be able to recognize our sin more and more, and we're not going to want to take it so lightly. We're going to be disgusted by it, just as Jesus is, right? Which brings us to our second point. We need to face our sin because, one, we can't fix a problem we won't admit we have, and two, otherwise Jesus is just a nice guy who did some cool things. When we read in the Bible about Jesus, here are some things that we do not find that Jesus says. So just to be clear, we don't find this in the Bible. We don't hear Jesus saying, hey guys, aren't I so nice? Aren't I such a nice guy? Hey, see these cool miracles I'm doing? Aren't they fun? Aren't they so cool? No. Just for clarity, we don't find that in the Bible. But what we do find is Jesus saying things like this. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. And he also said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. So what is Jesus getting at then with the things that he does say in the Bible? Jesus, because Jesus is God, knows that we are made in the image of God. We're image bearers of God. That's how we're created to be. But Jesus knows that sin gets in there and distorts some things sometimes. And Jesus came to save our lives. That's why we call him our savior and our Lord, our leader and forgiver. Now, some of us might be thinking, okay, this is a sermon on sin, but I don't really feel sinful. Like, I don't really feel broken. And others might agree with that and be like, yeah, actually, I'm really good. I live a pretty good life and I treat others pretty well. That's great. Sin isn't about being good or bad. Sin is more than just bad things because it describes how easily we can deceive ourselves and spin illusions and redefine our bad decisions as good ones. Remember my self-talk earlier about like telling my husband a lie and 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 telling myself a lie. That was sin deceiving me into thinking, hey, just lie about this. You'll still get to Leavenworth. Just lie about it. And we see things like this, sin deceiving people. We see it all over in the Bible. King Saul, uh, in, in 1 Samuel, you can read all about King Saul, and he loved David. But then he hates David. What? How does this happen? Read all about it in 1 Samuel. And he is so jealous of David that he's actually hunting him down to go and kill him. Kill him, this man that he loved. He's out there to kill him. And he only gets convicted, um, and he's convicted by his ways, and he actually sees, oh, David isn't the enemy. I am. And then Saul says to David, I have sinned. I have sinned. Sin, separating, separating relationships, right? And then there's this prophet, Nathan, 
who goes and tells David about a guy who had a guy murdered just so he could shack up with his wife. And David hears this and he's like, oh my gosh, that is awful. That man should die. And Nathan goes, that man is you. David is so deceived by his sin that he doesn't even realize that the prophet Nathan is talking about David himself. And this is why sin is so tricky. We struggle with it because we can be blind to it, right? We can even convince ourselves that we're succeeding when we're sinning. So what do we do? What do we do about all of that? We go to Jesus. We go to Jesus. Karl Barth said, sin is most visible and evident in contrast to the righteousness and the holiness of God revealed in Jesus. Jesus, without Jesus, we hate ourselves instead of our sin. But with Jesus, we see ourselves made in God's image and how God intended, and we see how sin gets in the way of that. So what role does Jesus play in your life? Is he a nice guy who did some cool things? Or is he your savior? Do you know that you need to be saved? Jesus came that we might have life, and the life that he's talking about is the life abundant, life restored, life redeemed, a life where our sin is dealt with. So Bell Press, facing our sin means that we get to come face to face with Jesus. We don't face it alone because Jesus is the cure and that is our third point. So we need to face our sin because we can't fix a problem we won't admit we have. And secondly, otherwise Jesus is just a nice guy who did some cool things. And third, we need to face our sin because there is a cure and it is not us. Amen. Amen. Growing up, when my brothers and I were teenagers, they had this nickname for me. They called me Righteous Annie. <laughs> and while they didn't exactly mean this nickname to be a compliment, I kind of took it as one. I mean, 18-year-old Annie, she had, you know, things pretty much squared away. I had my life figured out. I checked the boxes I needed to. I knew what it took to like live a life that looked good on the outside and have all the right answers. And I would flaunt that in front of my brothers, which is maybe why they gave me the nickname Righteous Annie. And I texted my younger brother, Jeff, to see if he remembered the Righteous Annie era. And he texted me right back, right away. And he texted me a long text, which I'm just gonna read a short little snippet to you. Um, but I asked him if he, he remembered this, and here's what he said. He said, ha, 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 I do remember that. And he said, then a story, which I'm not gonna share. But then he said, <laughs> then he said, I wouldn't say, Annie, that you were ever wrong, but perhaps you were a bit Pharisee-like in your following of the rules. Ooh, yikes, he is spot on. Um, my brother calling me a Pharisee, and he had no idea what I was preaching on this weekend, but he, him calling me a Pharisee slash rule, rule follower definitely sums up everything righteous Annie wanted to be. And it's why Jesus tells the Pharisee who deemed themselves as righteous rule followers, it's why Jesus says to them, for I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus knows, and we now know that following the rules doesn't save us. We cannot save ourselves, but there is a cure and it is not us. And this is why Jesus is such good news. When we sin, it's a failure to be human as God intended because we fail to love God fully and love others fully. But enter Jesus, the one who did not sin, the one who fully loved God and fully loved others. In Romans, it says that we're slaves to sin. And then later on in Romans, it says, and the things that we don't want to do are exactly the things that we do. Oh, why are we so stuck in sin, right? And yet Jesus took responsibility for our sin and for our failures because he came to live for us and die for us and our sins and was raised to life and invites us into that same saving life. The apostle Peter puts it this way. Jesus committed no sin, yet he carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to our sins and live to do what is right. So is the goal to try not to sin or is the goal to believe that Jesus saves us and receive his mercy and forgiveness? Yes, to both of those things. But we don't need to walk around fixated on don't sin, don't sin, don't sin. Like that's more righteous Annie. 
That's more righteous Annie living, trying to follow the rules. But we can actually focus on the freedom that we have in Jesus, knowing that our sins are dealt with once and for all. And so instead of thinking, don't sin, don't sin, don't sin, we can actually fix our eyes on Jesus. And we can say, Jesus, I just wanna follow you. Jesus, how do I live like a disciple of yours today in this meeting or today on the basketball court or today when I'm going to school? How do I follow you? Do you guys see the difference? One is fixated on sin. One is fixed on Jesus, knowing that we can follow Jesus. Jesus is gonna be talking to us. It all goes back to that relationship. Rule following, like checking the boxes or relationship every minute of every day. It's different. And I know, I know what it's like to live the life of righteous Andy. And let me tell you, it's not fulfilling. Like it feels good to check boxes, but this feels way better. Being in like step with Jesus, relationship with Jesus, knowing I can talk to him about anything, right? Being in relationship with Jesus, it's, it's hearing his voice say, Annie, I know that you think you can live with this sin in your life, but I have come that you may have a different kind of life. So come with me. I will show you what it means to turn from that. And that's good news. And I, that's the life I'd rather live. So what is one way this week that we can face our sin? And I'm gonna give you one action step and that's it. And I've already said it. Pray the prayer, show me my sin. Pray this when you wake up in the morning, pray it when you go to bed at night, pray it individually, pray it as a family, pray it with your spouse, pray it with a mentor and know that God through the Holy Spirit will show you your sin. But don't worry, it's not gonna be like a laundry list. Here's all the things, Annie, that you did that you messed up on today. But God will highlight something and he'll say, come with me. I'll show you how to turn from that. When we see our sin, we get to repent of it. And another word for repent is just to turn, to turn away and live differently, think differently have a different change of your perspective. And if you pray the prayer, God, show me my sin, and you don't hear anything, don't think that you're exempt from it. Like keep <laughs> praying or, or pray with somebody else that you trust and know that the Holy Spirit will guide you in all truth. <laughs> That's funny. Um, <laughs> so Bell Press, know that Jesus calls us to live a life we cannot live apart from him. And that is good news. It's Jesus that's gonna show us our sin. It's Jesus that's gonna forgive us. He has already forgives our sins forever. And it's Jesus that will show us the life and life abundant. And that is good news. So God, we thank you for that good news. We thank you that you revealing our sin to us is good news. So Jesus, I pray that each and every one of us this week remembers that prayer, prays that prayer, and experiences the freedom that you have for us because of that prayer. You have come that we might have life and have it to the full. Jesus, I want, I want to be disciple Annie more than I want to be righteous Annie. So God, fill us with your spirit. Fill us with that hope. We love you, Jesus. Amen.